Okay, I'm gonna jump right in here. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, and thank you uh, to uh, everyone who made this uh, presentation possible. Uh, there's a lot of talk uh, about social distancing. And the way I like to think of it is uh, maybe we could talk about physical distancing and social connectedness. And because uh, for me, I think it's important to stay connected socially, even if we're physically distant. And so presentations like this and the work that uh, Sarah and Lantra and others are doing uh, really help us stay socially connected at this time, which is really important. I uh, just want to do one. Uh, if you can't uh, hear or see or need any technical help, just uh, jump right in and, and interrupt my presentation. Uh, I'm my name is Ben Hartman. I'm the farmer at Clay Bottom Farm in Goshen, Indiana. I'm also the author uh, of the two books you see on the screen here. And what I do is uh, we farm for a living, and I do education uh, around uh, teaching farmers how to apply the lean production system onto their farms. And I want to publicly recognize uh, that farming is physical, manual work. It's ordinary work. And uh, it's really the best kind of work that there is. And, uh, uh, and all of you who are engaged with your hands in farming are doing great work. And it's especially important and needed in these very uncertain times. What, what lean is, is essentially a Japanese production system. And it's a system that's focused on eliminating waste instead of just constantly growing your business as a way to as a way to grow your business. And so it's now, by now, um, uh, it, was, it had originated in, with Japanese uh, manufacturing. Uh, however, by now it's used globally by nonprofits and hospitals and uh, farms obviously are starting to now use it. And lean is a system for tough times, uh, for uncertain times. And there, uh, there are actually a lot of tools in the lean toolkit uh, that help during uh, times like we are in right now. I want to debunk a myth uh, at the beginning here that lean is just mean. Uh, that all it does is turn you into a heartless uh, farmer, <laughs> just out for profit. And certainly lean can help on the profit side of things. However, I hope you'll see throughout this presentation that lean doesn't have to replace the values that you might bring to your farm. Uh, maybe you got into uh, growing or producing food uh, because for ecological reasons, uh, because you wanted to actually contribute something mean, meaningful to your local community. And what Lean can do is help you meet the goals that you have and still give you time to focus uh, on uh, spending time with your family, with your kids, going on vacation, uh, having a more balanced lifestyle as a farmer, which is a challenge. And uh, these two uh, are our kids, and they are actually, to be quite honest, the reason we got into all this Lean stuff because we were working between 60 and 80 hours a week. And we realized uh, that uh, while we were making, uh, a, we we're making money, we weren't, um, we weren't making money and, stayed, and uh, still having time to spend with our kids. And so uh, we've really buckled down to make sure uh, that that happens. And looks like the, Oh, my screen suddenly quit working. Okay, so uh, turning waste into useful channels should be the slogan of every farmer. Uh, George Washington Carver said these words uh, over 100 years ago. Uh, and then smaller and smarter is the way that a farmer makes a profit. Booker T. Watley said he was a protege of George Washington Carver's. So these are uh, black farmers in the US who have been using lean thinking for a long time um, and actually, I show this slide to make the point that uh, all cultures have efficiency traditions, uh, not just the Japanese. I'm going to use a lot of Japanese language and terminology, and we're going to talk uh, about the particular Japanese case. Uh, however, uh, I really do think that in the UK, uh, uh, there is an efficiency tradition. Uh, among, I'm, Men I'm a Mennonite. Uh, I grew up Mennonite, and there's certainly a, a strong uh, uh, tradition of being efficient, not wasting anything in the Mennonite and Amish uh, communities around here. Uh, so, however, let's, uh, so the Japanese are my jumping off point because uh, they have perhaps codified efficiency thinking more than others, more so than others. And so, yeah, let's talk about rice production in 1700s Japan. So if we can take a cognitive leap, uh, escape all the troubles that we're in today, 
and go back to the Edo period of Japan, uh, about 150 years, this is a period of extreme isolation. Uh, they uh, developed kabuki uh, theater tradition, bunruku puppets, uh, samurai tradition, origami, and all these quintessentially Japanese cultural traditions really flourished during this time of isolation because Japan had cut itself off from China uh, and, and cargo ships are no longer going back and forth between China and Japan and the rest of the world hadn't yet quite discovered Japan. And so uh, a, a, a very unique time period in global history. And an interesting thing was happening on farms during this time period too, and historians call this Japan's industrious revolution. So what happened was you see the number of households, they had uh, a, a, a fast growing population at that time. So farmers had more mouths to feed, and yet look what happened to the number of oxen, went from 13,000 to 4,000. They, they lost their most important piece of technology on their farms. And the reason was that they didn't have the room, the pastures uh, for expanding um, this expanding population and also to feed, feed their uh, draft animals. And so farmers were left with a curious uh, predicament. And, and what would you do, for instance, if you had to produce more food the next growing season and you lost your most important piece of technology, say, a, your tractor or your greenhouse. And we know that they did it. These Japanese rice farmers stepped up to the task uh, through really two things, uh, old fashioned teamwork uh, and then very creative process improvement. Uh, they started working collectively and they still act in Japan, still farm in guilds and they call these, this yui, yui collective work. And especially with rice, there are a lot of stages in rice production, such as transplanting, uh, that really makes sense to be done in large groups. Uh, they refashioned a lot of their tools, which were oxen uh, driven tools uh, to be uh, used by humans. And if you wanna go down a, a fascinating rabbit, internet rabbit hole, hold and punch in farming tools from the Edo period in Japan. And I wish I, these tools were available to us today because of the precision uh, in their hand tools. Uh, and that precise, uh, agricultural engineering for small farms, it really continues in uh, a lot of Asian countries today in Japan and uh, South Korea is actually where most of our farm tools uh, on our farm come from because they've really, uh, their best agricultural engineering has always gone into great tools for small farms. Uh, they think on a square inch basis and here's uh, an image of radishes being growing in 50 cell plugs. Uh, this is on my farm, actually, and we grow rice, springtime radishes like this. But the idea is that instead of thinking of how can we be more efficient on a uh, per acre basis, which is how we think in, I'm in corn country, Indiana, and we, everything's talked about it on a per acre basis. Uh, we're, they're really thinking on a per inch basis, how do we be more efficient in Japan with our agriculture? I wish I could say this was our farmer's market truck, but it isn't. This is, uh, a, a Japanese truck, but aesthetics has always been an uh, important part of that too. But look how every square inch is used on the back of that truck. And this is a tool that we, uh, the video uh, portion doesn't seem to be working here, but this is a, <clears throat> a uh, paper pot transplanting tool uh, that is a Japanese uh, invention that helps us with our transplanting. You see there's a chain uh, that unravels and the plants uh, are transplanted when I, uh, when I pull this tool along here and the chain unravels. And so I can transplant 260 uh, plants in about 40 seconds uh, from a comfortable upright uh, walking position. Okay, so uh, that's one mindset, the lean mindset from the 1800s um, Edo period in Japan where you're doing more with less, more production, you have less technology and less land uh, with which to produce. Now, let's make a shift and talk about the Industrial Revolution. Uh, because this was happening at the same time uh, as the industri as Japan's Industrial Revolution. Uh, in the US, in the UK, uh, we had these, uh, we have, well in the US in particular, we had this uh, phenomenon where we were pushing the native peoples off the land and we suddenly had tens of thousands of acres available to us uh, for agricultural production and they say this is the beginning of what we call more with more agriculture or industrialized agriculture. And so in 1834, the McCormick Reaper, 
a tool designed to do more with more, la more land available. Uh, John Deere in 1842 would send rail cars uh, of plows uh, designed for the sticky prairie soils uh, in the US here. And we we're just plowing up the land uh, at a ferocious pace. And that trend has really continued. I'm gonna skip about 200 years of agricultural history just to tell you, just to summarize that we're by now in a state of gigantic agriculture here. And there are pockets of exception, of course, our farm being one. Uh, but uh, the vast majority of food produced uh, is at a, at, a, at a gigantic scale of uh, usually 10,000 acres or more. So let's take a wide angle view of, of that particular way of growing food, and then we'll jump back into lean. So what, what happens when uh, you lose that focus and when you develop a farm system that is focused on just doing more, uh, then you lose farmers. And so you can see in 1790, nearly everyone was engaged in agriculture for a living and skip ahead to 2010 and fewer than 2% in the US and the UK uh, are engaged in farming uh, of some sort for a living. Uh, we've, uh, we've really uh, relied on machines to do our farming and then we bring in food from other countries. Uh, farm size is, is now huge. It's, it doubles every 20 years, uh, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, and so look at the, this is very, these are recent numbers here. Look at the number of farms in the U.S. Uh, on a steep decline. And the average farm size, uh, that number continues to climb. And so we're, it's worth asking the question, how many more years can we keep posting charts like this? Pretty soon we'll will be out of uh, farmers uh, altogether and just have a very small number of gigantic farms. That really seems to be the trend. And here's some numbers from uh, the United Kingdom, which the, the line looks just as steep, if not steeper, uh, the line over here uh, for the US in terms of uh, the workforce on farms. Okay, and so we can ask, it's fair I think to ask the question too, is, that, is this working? Uh, is, is that way of farming serving the public? And uh, one metric you could look at is life expectancy. And in the US and the UK, we have declining life expectancies. Uh, we know that during the Edo period in Japan, uh, uh, during the Industrious Revolution, that lifespan increased by 10 years. Let me say that again, lifespan increased by 10 years uh, during the Edo period in Japan. This was the uh, 1700s and early 1800s, a very difficult time period uh, in which to increase uh, the life, the life, life, and yet they did it. And we can't seem to do that uh, here in our context. Now, not that there isn't some tough news too for local farmers. Um, you can see the numbers here uh, in terms of declining numbers of sales for direct to consumer sales. Uh, in the U.S. at least have been on the decline, not on the increase uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, farmers markets, uh, they, you hear this terminology all the time, but farmers market saturation. Uh, we opened up about 8,700 markets here and we're not opening up more markets. Uh, most CSAs uh, have been losing more than half their customers on a yearly basis here for at least the last five years. So we've been tracking, uh, tracking those numbers. And so, I don't want this to be a doom and gloom session. There's plenty of tough news in the newspapers on an hourly basis, um, and because really I think there's a lot of hope. Uh, and I think there are incredible opportunities uh, for farmers who are, who are willing to wrap their minds around this, uh, being an agile farm, being a lean farm, and doing things a little bit differently. Uh, for instance, sales to institutions are up by almost 300%. This is to say that hospitals, schools, and, uh, uh, and uh, conference centers, these places are wanting to source local food. The demand is here. Uh, there's a boom in home, the home delivery market, especially, uh, obviously, with the coronavirus. Uh, people want the food delivered to their doorstep. And even before uh, all the lockdowns started happening, uh, this was the fastest growing segment of uh, of the uh, of the food industry, uh, were, were farms who are able to wrap their minds around getting food delivered closer to their customers. 
uh, the top restaurant trend um, uh, in recent years has been hyper local sourcing. Uh, and this is how we had structured our business really. 80% uh, of our food up until a few weeks ago when the restaurants closed, uh, had been going to restaurants. Uh, local food pays off. Uh, the term organic is still an important term, and I'm not, I don't wanna encourage you to lose your organic certification if you have it. However, the research is showing that the term that local is, act is actually uh, a more powerful advertising term on food. People, the demand is there. People want local food now more so than they ever have. Okay, so we have this schizophrenia thing happening. And we have the fastest growing types of farms in the US and the UK are gigantic farms. And yet, uh, there's this other trend happening where we have female led farms, farmers, young farmers under age 35, and micro farms, uh, one or two acres uh, or less, selling directly to customers. Uh, these are uh, home delivery farms. These are also farms that are growing very quickly. It's the farms in the middle that are tending to get squeezed out. Okay, let's go back over to Japan and figure out how those rice farmers were able to do it. And I'm gonna tell you their stool, tell you a story of how they did it, mostly through uh, the, the story of Toyota. So lean is a system for tough times like we are in now, which is why I think lean has so much to so much, so much to offer agriculture uh, at this time in history, which I think is, a, a globally speaking, probably the biggest challenge since World War II, if not bigger than the challenge of World War II. We're expected to lose more lives in the US here uh, than in the Korean and the Vietnam Wars combined. Uh, we're facing a very grim couple of weeks, and I really think grim couple of years. The Japanese industry after World War II had bombed out factories. There were no stable suppliers. In other words, no one making the tires and bumpers they needed for their vehicles. Very little capital to work with uh, to, to, to run a business. And obviously, uh, very limited market for cars in Japan. Uh, we had bombed out the, the infrastructure, the roads uh, in Japan, and no one was buying cars at the time. And they had these giant automated factories in the US to compete with. Ford, GM, and Chrysler have been cranking out war machines. And the slide was just uh, perfectly greased, perfectly greased for US companies to have a total run on the global automobile market for several decades. And we produced a lot of crappy vehicles during those several decades. However, we really dominated the market. Uh, and so what's Toyota to do in this context? They said, okay, we're gonna have to get creative and they created what they call the Toyota production system. They said, we're gonna try and catch the US in their productivity uh, in a couple of years. They're not gonna be able to produce more vehicles than us, but they're gonna try to make them uh, in a more productive fashion, more efficiently. They're gonna have to do it without large capital investments. And they're gonna have to use the workforce they have, which happen to be these rice farmers, these uh, Edo period rice farmers. Or I should say the grandchildren uh, of these rice farmers. And the, the first, uh, well, the first spelling of Toyota had a, a D -E at the end and not a T. And the literal translation is fertile rice fields. And so necessity was the mother of invention. This is going to have to be a new kind of a business. Skipping ahead uh, uh, several decades, uh, we can, I could just sum it up by saying Toyota did it. They became number one in profits, number one in employee retention, number one in market share. It was doing something right. It was a very different style of business. And eventually MIT uh, sent a team of, in Massachusetts Institute of Technology, sent a team of researchers over to Toyota to figure out what the heck was going on. And those MIT researchers codified what they called the lean, the lean system, the lean production system. Okay, I wanna back up and explain a little bit about our farm, and then I'm gonna integrate these two. I'll show you how we've used lean concepts on our farm and go deeper into the lean concepts. So uh, we, uh, my wife and I run a four season specialty crop farm. I'm in Northern Indiana, and it's our 15th a year uh, of in operation. And we have typically have three part-time staff people working with us. We have this crazy local commitment. 
where we've said we want to sell 100% of our food within a mile and a half of us. And it took us several seasons to get to this point. However, for the last uh, last three uh, growing seasons, uh, we've not we've not sold food outside of that one and a half mile radius. Uh, we have a strong ecological commitment. We got into farming this type of farming because we wanted to do a better type of farming than the large scale corn and soybean farming we see around us. And so we uh, we're a net zero farm through solar panels and and by keeping very simple in our technology here. And we've become a behind the scenes farm for six artisan restaurants. Uh, essentially, I meet with the chefs every winter, take orders from them, and pretend that I work at the back end of the restaurant growing food that gets uh, shipped to the, that we that we do direct delivery to the restaurant three times a week. And we've really uh, leaned up over the years. We were we went from working 60 to 80 hours a week to 35 hours a week. It's a very strong commitment we have. So we have time to spend with our our kids and go camp go on camping trips and that sort of thing. Uh, five acres, uh, we had been farming a full five acres and we're down to farming about a half of an acre in production. Uh, went from growing uh, more than 60 types of crops to leaning up to five focus crops. We still, and biodiversity is still very important to us. We still have a very biodiverse home garden, a lot of fruit trees. Uh, however, we needed to find some techniques to focus on crops and processes that were actually making us money and get rid of the others. And then uh, we really leaned up our organization. Uh, we, we were farming with thousands of tools and we leaned up to just a handful of tools uh, that we use to, to make our living. And I should say that with the corona of iris, we really had a wrench thrown at us uh, about a week and a half or two weeks ago when our six artisan restaurants all closed. And so we are in the middle of re, uh, reorganizing and there are lean tools that, that have really helped us in the last couple of weeks to pivot our farm. Uh, and uh, I'll get into some of those tools in a minute, but uh, just to summarize, we quickly set up uh, CSA. And at this point, um, we, uh, at this point we have sold all, we sold out of CSA memberships and are planning for a door to door, uh, direct to your door, uh, delivery service this, this growing season. Okay, so this is um, a picture of our house. It's a barn house. We live in half of it and we farm in the, and the other half is used for farming. A pro you see a propagation house, there's a spray station, processing room and equipment storage and such uh, in here. Uh, and our focus really is, uh, is no waste production. Uh, we like to say that every seed should turn into cash. That doesn't always happen, but that's the goal that we have. And uh, the, really to make that a reality, we have to eliminate complexity. If you're into diversified small scale agriculture, especially vegetables perhaps, then you know that it's easy to become, for complexity to overwhelm your growing system. Just crack open a seed catalog and you see the thousands of seed options. And I've just described to you um, lots of marketing options. And how do you choose the right seed? How do you choose the right market? And how do you find a match uh, that lets you work just 35 hours a week and still earn a comfortable living? Yeah, the, really the, the solution is uh, through simplicity. And so here's a simple vision. There are 43,000 square feet occupy uh, one acre of land. You have to walk, so let's devote a third to paths. And that's gonna leave you 30,000 square feet on which to grow food, okay? Now, a head of lettuce is a good crop to do a little math with. And so uh, a head of lettuce occupies one square foot. And we can sell heads of lettuce for about $2 uh, a head here. And so that should mean that uh, if we can grow two crops a year, which is not a problem most places in the United States or probably the United Kingdom, uh, any farm growing the simplest crop there is to grow, a head of lettuce is a relatively simple crop to produce. Any farm should be able to grow, just in terms of the, their production, $120,000 worth of product on a uh, per acre basis a year. And at, I'll tell you that it's a lot of bending over to put those heads in if you use the paper pot transplant method, that tool I showed you. Uh, there are ways to eliminate that, uh, the, that burden. So this is not difficult to achieve from a pure production standpoint. 
And let's say we devote some of that land to tomatoes. Well, tomatoes can yield $540,000 an acre. They have three times the square foot value of uh, a lettuce. So from a pure uh, production standpoint, uh, the numbers are here. Uh, what the challenge is, is that uh, muda creeps in, or waste, uh, muda being the term for waste in, Jap uh, in Japan, uh, muda creeps in. So for example, uh, pests might eat half your crop. Uh, the, the weather might destroy your crop. Uh, you have marketing challenges. What chef wants 100, or what chef is gonna want um, 30,000 heads of lettuce at one time? Okay, and so you're gonna have to probably introduce a bit of complexity into your system. For instance, you should probably do three or four plantings of lettuce so you don't have it all coming ripe at the same time. Uh, you might need to find uh, a handful of chefs instead of just one chef to, to sell to or different accounts or different types of accounts. Uh, you might want to not just grow head lettuce, introduce a few other crops. But what I'm, my point here is that you want to introduce complexity only as needed and when needed and in the smallest amount possible. Okay, does that make sense? Only when needed, as needed, and in the smallest amounts possible. For the most part, keep a simple, farm, a simple vision, no matter whether you're producing eggs, uh, meat, uh, produce. So how do we go about doing this? Lean says you wanna be honest about who's in charge of your farm. And on a lot of farms, uh, complexity is in charge, okay? And what Lean says is that you wanna put yourself in front. You wanna farm, uh, you, don't, you, wanna, you want your farm to work for you, you don't wanna work for your farm. And I'll tell you that many evenings, Rachel and I would come in and realize that we have just worked all day for the farm. Uh, the farm wasn't working for us. And so uh, Lean is about, Lean, Lean really encourages some simple metrics. And we call these head metrics because we, they're so simple, we can keep track of them in our heads. Uh, we can measure them very easily. And it's something, these are numbers that the whole team uh, can wrap their minds around. <clears throat> and I'm not saying these should be numbers that you replicate, um, but they're ones that, they're like a train track. They keep our train on the track to make sure we're, uh, our activities are, 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 are leading to profit. So crop, we say crops should yield $3 a square foot or more, uh, or we need to question whether we should be growing them. Uh, we harvest all of our crops in the 40 gallon totes. And so we say our crops should be high dollar value crops. About $40 worth should fit into those totes. And that, and to be honest, encouraged us to eliminate larger crops like watermelons and butternut squashes, uh, where only a few dollars worth might fit into a tote. Crops should go from field to cooler at $100 an hour. This means is that's a harvesting metric, uh, where crops, uh, from the time we uh, grab a knife and start our harvest to the point at which the produce has been been washed and packaged and labeled and in a cooler ready for our customers. Uh, did we achieve those activities at a rate of $100 an hour? Uh, sales activities, did we sell our food at a rate of about $300 an hour, whether we're sitting at a farmer's market or doing direct delivery to door-to-door -door customers or dropping food off at restaurants? Whatever the sales activity, from the point at which our van left the property to the point at which it came home, uh, did we drop off X amount on an hourly basis? And so I would encourage you on your farm to think about what are two or three or four or simple head metrics that might challenge you a little? Uh, what I would recommend is figure out where you exist, where you land at this point. So, for instance, on the sales activity, uh, what is your current average sales on an hourly basis? And challenge yourself. Let's say it's, it's currently $300 an hour. Challenge yourself and say, this growing season, what would it take to bump that up to $400 an hour? And... Uh, Lean is not about spending hours and hours with spreadsheets uh, recording data. This is, these should be, this should be, your metrics should be easy to measure, quick to measure, ideally in your heads. And you should, uh, I should say, I want to break here and say that you all should be uh, jotting down your questions. There should be a question and answer uh, section uh, on the webinar platform. And then I'm gonna leave 15 minutes at the end, plenty of time at the end that I want to be able to go over your questions and have more of a back and forth type of a conversation.
Okay, so here's specific. Here's specifically what happened to us was that the dollar value on a square foot basis. You see the, the graph on the on the left, at least on my screen, it's the left. Uh, what we had to do was say, okay, we're going to draw the line uh, at crops below three dollars a square foot, and the same with um, the dollar value for fourteen gallon tote. So these were fairly easy to track. Um, and uh, what div the difficult part was, was making the commitment to stop producing crops that actually weren't giving us a profit. I, it, because in reality, uh, the Pareto principle, uh, the Pareto principle is that 20% of your effort, most likely, most businesses, 20% of your time and effort, 20% uh, of your products are giving you 80% of your profits, 80% of your results. And so it's so amazing how this continues to be true. Uh, we started applying this uh, idea about eight years ago on our farm. Uh, we couldn't, I'll be honest, we couldn't get rid of 80% of what we were doing and just focus on 20. Uh, but we tried to at least eliminate, uh, we, we certainly eliminated more than half uh, of our efforts and products. And so we could focus on the, uh, the crops that were making us money, but it's so, it's incredible that you can do this year after year and it continues to be true. Uh, and so that even I can think back to my previous growing season, we had a, uh, a overall a good season last year, but I can still think back and say, you know, it probably is the case that about 20% uh, of my efforts brought in 80% of the profits. Uh, so uh, what has happened on our farm is we've just become very focused. You see greens here, a, a baby cut greens are, uh, we're in high demand in our market, and we decided to really focus very hard on them uh, and to fill up every square inch of our greenhouses and our field plots with them and have these tiny little, uh, you know, uh, tiny little walk paths. Or they're only five inches, actually, uh, for walking, uh, and then fill the rest of the land up with, product that, um, with products our customers tell us they want. Uh, tomatoes, being, tomatoes being another crop, and so... Um, in our, our greenhouses, uh, this is what our greenhouse looks like um, uh, at this time of the year. We have young tomatoes in there and uh, interspersed with our baby cut greens. Uh, we didn't start out being very focused on our farming. I grew up on an actual corn, soybean, and cattle farm. I got a degree in philosophy. And Rachel had, uh, grew up in a Mennonite farm too. The giant garden did a lot of canning. And at the beginning, uh, we were an urban farm. We bought this dilapidated house in town and started uh, growing food um, in, uh, the tennis, in a tennis, clay bottom tennis court that was next to that house. And what we did was plow up that tennis court first thing. And you can see how young and naive we are here. Uh, and grew just lots of types of crops and had an eight foot table at our farmer's market and had a lot of fun. Too. We, we eventually rented other yards around town and that's how we grew our business until we realized uh, that oh, I'm not sure what happened to the graphic here but we, until we realized that um, it wasn't quite working to um, it wasn't quite working to uh, have to bike all of our tools around town all the time and we couldn't put in greenhouses and the infrastructure we wanted so Skip ahead to say we eventually bought a farm and our goal is to grow fast. Uh, I grew up on a corn farm and I thought you had to have hundreds of acres to make a living as a farmer. And uh, so we started by building greenhouses very quickly. Uh, it's, it's tool storage, orchard, compost yard, and, uh, processing room. Uh, we built up lots of very quick infrastructure with the idea we'd be a big farm, a real farm uh, within a year or two. And we worked really hard. Our production system was probably too low tech. Uh, lean is not anti-technology. Uh, lean is about smart technology, uh, tools that interface well with the humans using them. And to be honest, we were using too many hand tools and uh, too many hours were going into our work week and it was back breaking. We were physically and emotionally uh, drained. We we're wearing out. And then this happened. Uh, one afternoon of 40 mile an hour wind, uh, picked up one of our greenhouses, our, uh, one of our, our newest greenhouse. We put all of our money and time and effort into it and blew it right on top of the barn. And we thought, oh man, 
maybe this is the end of the road for us. Uh, we're just, uh, we're burning out here and then we just lost our big investment. And Rachel, uh, we were in the house at the time this happened and Rachel heard, um, she heard a thunk and she ran to the, ran to the window, the kitchen window, looked out the window and saw this structure on the barn roof. And she, all she did was she, she said, oh dear, Ben, you better come take a look. And so I ran to the window and took one look at the greenhouse. I didn't say anything. I just went to the fridge and grabbed a couple of Heinekens and we had to have a good, uh, long think. Uh, and I'll tell you what happened. Uh, uh, it was within a week of that happening, as we were wrestling with whether to continue farming, uh, within a week, we got, uh, we got a letter in the mail from one of our CSA customers, and the, she wanted to remain anonymous, and the letter included a check uh, that was enough for another greenhouse. And uh, around that time, one of our chefs uh, emailed me, and he said, I'd like to continue getting your I heard what happened to your greenhouse, but I still want to get your tomatoes. Uh, what's it going to take? And I said, well, I'm kind of short one greenhouse. I'm going to need another greenhouse somehow. And he said, hey, if you come up with the financing for the greenhouse, I'll come out and I'll build the greenhouse. And, um, and then I remember on that time too, I, one of our CSA customers emailed me and said, hey, I, I heard what happened and uh, we've been using the lean system in our factory. He owned an aluminum trailer factory uh, and lean system in our factory for a couple of years. And it's really something. And I wonder if it could work for you too. And he offered to come out and give us some business coaching. And so uh, to summarize, our community was telling us, hey, we're going to put the building blocks underneath you uh, and make sure your business continues. And we just couldn't say no. And so we got back into it. Let's go back over to Toyota, to Japan, to the rice farmers, uh, because these are, I'm going to sh sh show you, go over four essential core lean principles. And these are the four core lean principles that we use to repivot our own farm after that greenhouse incident. And it's, these are the four principles that Toyota used uh, in their context to, to grow their business and eventually overtake the U.S. auto manufacturer. Number one is get organized. Uh, and Lee has this 5S system of organizing and it essentially amounts to being ruthless, getting rid of anything non-essential from your business. Number two, precisely identify value. Uh, this is, value is an attribute you get from your customers and only your customers. You're not allowed to define value, just your customers. Three is cut out the muda or waste, uh, which roughly translates to anything that's not in the service uh, of adding value for your customers. And then fourth is practice Kaizen, continuously improve every year. So lean is not a complicated system. It takes a lot of discipline and a lot of creative thinking to implement it, but the core structure of the system is not complicated. So what I'd like to do in the rest of this presentation is go over each of these four points uh, in detail and also to give you examples of how we use them on our farm and suggest some ways that a farm of any size and type can use them uh, when times are tough, like they are right now, uh, to carve out a space for yourself and to contribute something uh, valuable for your communities. It starts with this formula here, eliminated waste equals capacity. So what we needed uh, when the greenhouse hit the roof was capacity. We needed another greenhouse we needed time. Uh, the way most businesses create that capacity is through money. They throw money at their problems uh, or land at their problems. They, they grow more food on more land. Uh, what Lean says is there's a lot of waste in, in every business uh, system. And if you can just learn to notice it and get rid of it, you can free up, you can open up an incredible amount of capacity. If you shave, for example, four hours of waste per week, you can take a whole year off every 10 years without a dent in your profits. If you can shave 5% of your cost every year, and you can do that for 10 years, then you grow your business by 50%. And 
over 10 years, a very respectable rate of growth. And who couldn't, uh, and even now, at the end of every growing season, we go back over our expense ledger and ask that question, where's the 5%? It's not difficult to shave 5% every year. It just takes discipline. Okay, so the first of those four was the 5S uh, principle, the organizing. And what that amounts to is uh, decluttering. And we had to be honest that a lot of our, our items, on a lot of the physical things on our farm were not essential items. Uh, they were literally weights weighing down our production and obscuring the view of our work. We couldn't literally see past the junk sometimes. We started by with a visit to a lean factory and saw that they used these mobile tool carts where every worker had precisely the tools they needed and the parts they needed and no more. Every tool on this cart got touched on a daily basis uh, by the worker who's assigned to this cart and they don't have to rummage around uh, looking for wrenches that, they, that, they aren't, that aren't used for or needed in their production system. And so we wondered, could we apply that kind of thing on the farm? Here are four rules uh, that I would recommend that for you that have worked for us. Uh, define clear workspace boundaries. So most of us live and work in the same place. Uh, and the fishing, uh, uh, fishing gear gets mixed up with the hose and the garden tools sometimes find their way into the, into the house next into the garage. So what you need to do is say, this is my workspace and this is my living space. And to make sure that you apply some discipline to your workspace. So Mari Kondo, her books are wonderful and I recommend them for your house. Uh, but for your workspace, the 5S system is probably more applicable. Mari Kondo says you want to use a metric of joy. Does it spark joy? And if it does, then you should keep it. And if it doesn't, then you get rid of it. In 5S, they say the metric is, does it, is it useful? Can you remember actually touching the tool uh, in the past week or two, or let's say in the past season? Uh, and if you didn't touch it in the past season, then you should probably think about getting rid of it. Usefulness is the metric. You don't want to squirrel things. You actually physically want to physically remove them from the workplace. Third, as simple as best, you want to find a few number of tools to get the most work accomplished. So this is a repeated process. Part of Kaizen or continuous improvement is doing this every season, finding fewer number of every, and I'll tell you that uh, this past growing season, uh, we farmed with fewer tools than we ever have. And over the winter, I got rid of five or six more tools. We're going to farm with even fewer tools this season. And what that does is it keeps our work focused. It finds, makes it easier to find our tools. It makes it easier to take care of our tools. Fourth is use a red tag room. And what this is, is a, uh, you might call that think it over room, uh, where if you have something you're not sure you want to keep or, or not sure is useful to your production system, just stuff it in the red tag room so you can think it over. If you haven't gone to use that item in a, in a, in a couple months, then it's probably time to move it from the red tag room and give it to um, uh, uh, take it off to an auction or sell it over the internet or get rid of it somehow. This, this shouldn't be a complicated process, shouldn't take a long time. Uh, at the beginning, it certainly took us several weeks. Uh, however, uh, ideally, you get to a point where you can do your sorting in a, a, a day or two. And if it takes longer than that, then you probably have too many things and you're devoting too much time to organizing your things. So here's some before and after pictures. So here, this is what our, we had just collected all kinds of parts. Let's look at the, the number of shovels. We, I see like six or seven shovels hanging there. And really, do we need that many shovels? No, what we just thought we, it's a good shovel, we should keep it and collect it. And so we thought we'd collect every shovel made in Indiana on our farm. And what we did was we went around that mess and and said, hey, did we actually use that tool? And then we picked out our favorites, our best of tools, uh, and hung them up. Uh, and so our red tag room, we still use, uh, and it's a room where we'll stuff things that we're not sure belong on the farm. And it's like a vacuum cleaner that keeps a tidy farm. Number two is set in order. So you've picked a few items that are actually adding value for you. What do you do with them? you store them where, where you actually use them, as close as you can. And so spread them out around your farm. You'll see hooks and magnets and uh, whatnot all around our farm where we keep tools very close to where we're using them. Uh, and ideally at eye level, 
and on a horizontal plane. Uh, don't, don't stack tools in front of one another. Uh, spread them out so they're easy to see. Okay, number three is, uh, third principle is shine. And what this means is leaning up is about it's seen. You wanna clean with a toothbrush and then make sure your spaces are well lit and know what zero is. What zero means is, as the Amish might say, a room's not been cleaned till the floor's been mopped. That's what zero means. So it's important to define that, and I'll get to that in a second. So here's some before and after pictures. So we used to wash our produce in this dirty, dingy uh, shed, and then we decided to paint all the surfaces, put some high lumen light pictures in here so that we can see our work. And so it's very clear what zero means here. Uh, fourth is going to be standardizing. Every process should have a standard, meaning you do the same thing the same way every time. And you simplify every process every season. Standards should always be changing. Oh, my slides are getting, have a little tech, tech problem here, but anyhow, there's another slide of showing how our tools are lined up uh, near the field and near the greenhouse. Close, very close to their points of use. And there are just a small handful of tools on here too. Okay, so sustained with uh, pictures. Visual system management is a very important part of, uh, of Lean. And what that means is you do your sorting, setting in order, and shining uh, as part of your everyday work. This isn't a special activity that happens in the winter. This should happen uh, every day as you're working. Sustain means do without being told. And I'll tell you that the easiest way to do this we found is by hanging pictures. And Lean is all about using visuals as a way to explain how to do things. And so for instance, we would have pictures of zero in our, our processing room. This is what zero is. And in our spray station Lean to, which is the, the bottom picture. And so when it's time to, when you finish hosing 100 bunches of carrots, that's the time we tell our workers, hey, make it look like what the picture is here. And then we don't have to give a lot of instruction on how to stack the totes or where to store the hose. They can just look at the picture and keep the farm at zero for as much of the work week as possible. Okay, so this is just step number one. The whole point of this 5S is that uh, workers are more productive and happiest when they have what they need in front of them and no more, okay? Keep a simple farm and you'll have happier workers. Okay, let's move on to step number two is precisely identify value from your customers. And this is really at the heart of it. And so I wanna dwell a little bit longer here. Um, when it came time for Toyota to redesign the 05 Sienna, which is a minivan, they sent an engineer over to the US and Mexico and to Canada, the primary market. And they asked that engineer to observe, closely observe, more closely observe their customers than the US manufacturers. And I'll just give you one example. He went to Home Depot. Uh, which is a hardware store in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And he uh, saw that people were trying to stuff four foot by eight foot sheets of drywall and plywood into their, into their vehicles. And everything is four feet by eight feet here. And the minivans at the time weren't designed to accommodate a four foot by eight foot piece of something. And so he saw a lot of frustrated customers who are trying to strap their uh, plywood and drywall onto their vehicles or bungee the back hatch and it wasn't working. So he said the next van that we produce, we need to uh, widen it by a couple inches so these Americans can get there, can do their dry, can do their um, remodeling on the weekend. Okay, so that's just one example where we want to observe our customers more closely than our competition is the principle. So look at the three questions in the middle here. What do they want? When do they want it? How much? Okay. And these are really foundational for building your business and for transitioning your business. And I'll tell you that the coronavirus hit, we lost our restaurant customers, we went back to the drawing board, and we asked these three questions. Okay, what do our local customers want at this time? When do they want it? What's the amount they want it in? And we went and had some conversations. And I'll tell you what we heard here in Indiana is that what they wanted was home delivered food. They don't want to, people don't want to go out to grocery stores right now. If you're going to get sick, if you're going to get the uh, catch COVID-19, it's probably going to be grocery shopping. Uh, but that's about the only public space that's open anymore. So they, if they can avoid that trip, 
uh, that's a value to them. When do they want it? They want food at least on a weekly basis, uh, maybe more uh, than weekly basis. So we're doing at least going to deliver at least on food to them on at least on a weekly basis. And then we had some conversations about what's the amount, how much food are they wanting on a weekly basis, and and what do they want in their boxes, and get very precise on these answers. And that's how we were able to sell sell out of CSA shares very quickly. In part, the demand is just just here. Uh, we could. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, we sold out probably within eight or 10 hours of putting the offer out on the market. And so the demand is, is totally here for home delivered, uh, fresh, local, good produce. Uh, prior to that, uh, this is a picture I took maybe a month or so ago with one of my chefs. And uh, here, he and I are going over a, a sheet together that basically answers those three questions. I say, hey, Jesse, what do you want? When do you want it? How much do you want in the next growing season? And then, uh, so here's some of the answers that he gave me here. I get, get very specific. Do you want your tops left on your fennel? Uh, if you want fennel, how many inches of tops? When do you want your food delivered? For chefs, it's very important. Uh, they actually don't, do not want you to, to, to deliver food at five o'clock in the evening. They're trying to prep and have a lot of customers to deal with. They ideally want an early afternoon delivery. Uh, and then very specific on how much on a weekly basis they think they want. Uh, and so we do this, we, we do this with our six chefs or with our CSA customers. And you, you create what is essentially an order. And you take the order that you've received and you construct your farm plan around it. And so this is, we keep a visual farm plan. These are our field plots and our greenhouses. And there's nothing that's, that's on this a map, this farm map that we didn't get from a, a chef or from one of our customers. And now we've talked to our CSA customers, we've erased everything on here. Part of the reason I like to do this visual with a dry erase system is that we can be a nimble farm and quickly change uh, what crop is going in and what bed and quickly change our farm system. And I'll be honest that we erased probably more than half of what was on here uh, in the last week and a half. Uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah from Lantro was like, "How? Why can't I get a hold of you? What's going on?" And the reason is we were so busy restructuring our business um, that I wasn't checking my email very often. So I apologize. However, um, we very quickly restructured our business and have, at this point, sold all the food that we're about to produce. Okay, so let's skip ahead, and we are going to talk about the third step here, which is tackling the muda, uh, which is waste. According to Lean, there are essentially just three types of activity that happen on your farm at any given time. Uh, there are type one Muda activities, type two Muda activities, and value adding activities. So let me go over these. Again, Muda is the term for waste. However, it's not a great translation. Here's the reason. Type one Muda are necessary activities that don't add value. So on a farm, there are things that you just have to do that your customer is not going to cut you a check to do. Okay, let me give you an example, doing your taxes. You have to do your taxes, your customer is not going to cut you a check because you spent two weeks doing your taxes. Uh, doing lawn mowing, uh, excessive cleaning. Uh, these are things you, uh, seed ordering, you have to get your seeds ordered, supply ordering. You have to do these activities, but a customer's not paying you to do them. So that's in that category, okay? And what the Danish farmers who use the lean system, what they told me that they, they like to use the term suspicious. You wanna be suspicious as to whether you need to do these activities and is there a more efficient way to do them. Type two muda is pure waste, okay? This would be excessive transportation, overproduction. There's actually seven types of waste and I'm gonna to get to those in a minute. Uh, third would be value adding activities. And surprisingly, just a few activities on most farms are in the value adding category. In my case, when I plant carrot, when carrot seeds arrive in the mail, when I order the carrot seeds, that's Muda. When they get shipped here, that's Muda. When I pick up that carrot seed and put it in the ground, when there's soil contact, then, then there's a value adding act activity that has happened. Okay? But uh, maintaining the cedar, storing the cedar, retrieving the cedar, and all the activities sur surrounding getting the seed planted was muda. It's just the, 
planting of the seed that a customer actually values that activity. And then Mother Nature does a lot of value adding, uh, which is why we keep our farm processes simple and opened up so Mother Nature does as much work as we can let uh, Mother Nature do. And I'll, I won't have time to get into our particulars of our system, maybe at a future webinar we can, but for now, it's just to say we keep our farming as simple as possible so that Mother Nature does as much value adding as possible. And then when we harvest those carrots, we double the value of them. When we wash the carrots and hose them off, we probably triple the value of the carrots. And then when we deliver them, physically move them from our farm close to the customers, that's a value adding activity because the carrots are worth more. And so we can summarize a value activity by saying it's an activity where you make a physical manipulation, you physically touch an ob object, and you cause the value of the object to go up. You physically touch the object and you cause the value of the object to go up and everything else is muda. Here's a, here's a map of value stream map of Danish dairy farm and how they're tracking type one muda, type two muda, uh, and value adding activities with three colors of sticky notes. Okay, Taichi Ono uh, at Toyota identified seven mudas. I said we'd talk about the type two mudas, the pure waste. There are seven types, and I'm going to show you with pictures, so uh, you can jot down notes and keep track of them here, but I'm gonna, in the next, in the last 5, uh, 12 or 15 minutes, I'm going to go over these seven mudas, because this is really, after you've identified value from your customers, chipping out the muda is, uh, is the way you build yourself a strong business at a time, uh, during uncertain times. You cannot afford, these mudas on your farm uh, when times are tough, okay? So first is overproduction. And overproduction waste is the most insidious of them because you cannot afford uh, to make all the investments in uh, researching a crop, planting a crop, tending a crop, harvesting, washing, packaging, delivering, and then for that crop to come home unsold uh, is devastating on your business. You simply have to sell everything that you produce as much as possible. Uh, we have very, I show you how we collect orders from customers and then we, on the back end when we harvest, we have careful sales tracking uh, so that we align our production with demand. And you can see the list up here of our chefs, our restaurants, and a list of our products here. We're gonna very carefully track what they order on a weekly basis, make sure we're, we're only gonna harvest what they've ordered and no more. Uh, we do a three-tiered marketing uh, scheme. And the idea here is that we never grow a food item just for one market. Uh, if a chef has ordered uh, these uh, French heritage tomatoes here, we'll say, sure, we'll grow them if we can find some backup markets. And so I'll tell you how that has worked in the past for us. I'm not quite sure how it'll play out this year. Um, but we would have a uh, Saturday farmer's market and we'll sell uh, food at that farmer's market. And then leftovers from that farmer's market can go into a Monday morning, we would pack CSA boxes. So some leftovers can go in those CSA boxes. And then on Monday afternoons, we would have deliveries to restaurants. And so what's left over from the farmer's market from the CSA packing can uh, ideally or potentially at least be sold to chefs at restaurants. And so we, you see we have stacks, three st stacks um, that allow us to sell virtually everything that we produce. Uh, waiting waste, when is your product? And, I'll, and I want to, not to be braggadocious, but we have uh, six chickens here uh, at our farm and we don't have enough waste at this point to feed our six chickens. And so with some careful thinking, it is possible even on a complex diverse vegetable farm to sell what you produce. Uh, second, of the seven types of mudas is waiting waste. This means is when is your product sitting around? When are workers waiting? Okay. You want your product to constantly be moving towards your customer. And this is gonna look different depending on the type of farm business you have. Um, in our case, uh, we saw that our food was waiting in walk-in coolers. Uh, like many produce farms, we thought the cooler was the, you just had to have a big cooler. You stuff everything into coolers. So you have an inventory of food in your cooler, and then you sell from your cooler. And really that's a wrong headed way to go about your business. 
and what we decided was, hey, could we get to a point where we actually eliminate the waste of waiting and completely eliminate the walk-in cooler? And throw, so through creative scheduling, uh, what we do is harvest our, in this case, tom our tomatoes, and harvest them directly into the boxes going to the customers, and we put them directly into our vehicle, and off they go uh, within an hour or two uh, for, to our customers. And we had a four hour turnaround time, uh, was our average turnaround time last year. What that means is from when a chef puts an order into us, it's to their restaurant within four hours. And even the Amazon truck can't beat uh, that turnaround time. And so it's very appealing to our accounts and it's how we are able to keep our chefs for a long time. And it eliminates waiting waste on our farm and the cost of having to maintain that cooler. This is just one example from our farm. The point is, notice when is your food product sitting and not moving closer to your customer and how can you uh, keep it moving? The third is transportation waste, too much driving. Okay, now I said this is the, we're, we're living in the air, in the air, excuse me, in the era of home delivery. And so you see us packing CSA boxes here. And what we will do is, in the same fashion, we're going to pack our CSA boxes directly in the vehicle as we harvest. We'll harvest those carrots and beets, turnips or head lettuce or tomatoes or whatever in these air conditioned, stripped out vehicles. And we'll put them directly into the boxes here and then off they'll go to our customer within an hour or two of harvest. Very quick turnaround time. And we live within a mile and a half of all our customers, so that makes it fairly easy to do multiple trips. Um, however, the point here is to come up, with, um, come up with some numbers that keep you efficient. I know one farmer who says they, they don't allow their delivery vehicle to leave the property until there's $500 worth of produce on the vehicle. Uh, I've shared you previously that we have a $300 an hour rate uh, that we want to sell at least that much on an hourly basis for our trips. Okay, next type of waste is over processing. Uh, and so it's so critical to know the right level of processing and this is up to your customer. At a farmer's market, your, our customers at least do not actually want plastic around their food. There's a big anti-plastics movement here. We are totally behind it. And we are hoping to eliminate plastics from our farm in the next season or two. Uh, it's not hard to do at a farmer's market. They just are happy to have open air produce. If you sell to other accounts, however, you see the tomato boxes in the background here. Uh, our chefs want a particular type of inside of tomato box. Some accounts want, stick, want labels on their products. We sell to a couple of grocery accounts that want barcodes, uh, QR codes, and a fancy label, sticker label, and we'll do that for them. However, we don't do that at our farmer's market, okay? And I see this all the time. That's why I wanna uh, really emphasize that point. Do not overpackage your food. Uh, that's a form of waste. Uh, next is waste of inventory. You don't wanna keep food on your farm, like I mentioned. Keep it moving. I don't like to see food stockpiling on our farm. And I don't like to see stockpiles of supplies here too. We keep just the right amount of row covers on our farm. Uh, I order seeds in small quantities every month. So we, we're not stockpiling the things we need to grow all that food. And you see that we don't, um, we have one bicycle helmet too. We don't stockpile bicycle helmets. Okay, a waste of defect. This means that when did your gallon, when did you have milk go rotten? When did meat, when was meat rotten? Uh, freezer burned? When was there defect? When did you have uh, moldy lettuce? Any form of defect is waste and it really pays to hone in on it. Uh, the Japanese, they say you ask why five times. So why did that spinach get moldy? Well, because it was too humid in the greenhouse. Well, why was it too humid in the greenhouse? Because we underventilated the greenhouse. And why did we underventilate the greenhouse? Because we were too busy and we didn't have time to automate the system. So whatever the answers, the point is you really dig deep, ask why five times to get at the root of the problem. And uh, if, you, um, if you see these Japanese farms, you really see that uh, they are harvesting and planting, or they're planting and harvesting, they're, they're harvesting every crop they plant. Uh, there's, no, um, there's no cushion there. And so what we noticed was that it was through direct seeding that we were having a lot of problems because the wind would dry the soil surface. 
uh, or uh, we'd have poor germination because it was too hot or too cold or too what. So we found that we just had better luck with transplanting and started transplanting our radishes and turnips and uh, a lot of crops that we had been drag seeding just to avoid the, the risk factor with, with drag seeding. There's green beans even that uh, we are transplanting here. Then you know, then we know we've got good germination, we've got a healthy crop of beans, and um, uh, there's all kinds of advantages. Okay, we got five more minutes. I'm gonna breeze through the last couple of wastes and then um, get to your questions. Uh, waste of motion, uh, you wanna ideally uh, use this, you wanna think in, in, uh, scientifically, and this spaghetti diagram uh, that you're looking at here is a very powerful tool whether you do it physically or just in your head with your imagination, what you wanna do is imagine the lines of work on your farm. And what you're looking at here is our processing room and we're washing uh, lettuce. And you can see the motion, whenever someone has moved, a line gets traced. So what you can do is that you're busy, on a busy afternoon, have someone stand in a corner and watch you work and uh, trace motion. When did a person move? When did a product or tool move? And uh, by the end of half an hour, you'll have a plate that looks, you'll have a paper that looks like a plate of spaghetti noodles. And then what you do is you sit down and you analyze the noodles. Can we shorten, straighten, or eliminate uh, any of those noodles? And uh, so in the case of our processing room, uh, we decided to, we did that process, and we decided to, for example, move our cleaning supplies uh, so they're up at eye level location so a person didn't have to twist around and look in the cabinet uh, for the cleaning supplies. Just to give you one example. Uh, here's uh, a factory who's doing the spaghetti diagram method. Uh, but any, any type of business, there is motion, there is movement, and you can trace that movement and then you can analyze it. Uh, when you're setting up a farm, deciding where to place your your buildings uh, and, how to set, and how to set up your fields, you can do this too. And so for instance, in Indiana at least, people like to spread out their buildings all over the place and a better way to do it is line up your functions. So we have a propagation house here that is going to be close to our fields. And then food comes in, it goes to a spray station, processing room, uh, then some cooler rooms, and then off to your customers. So you, you have functions all lined up. You have nice straight lines of motion. And the better way to do it, the best actually, is to bring those fields in so you're not walking a long distance to your fields. And then you jam all your functions up together. And so we jammed all our greenhouses close to the processing room. We attached our, our um, propagation house up next to the spray station, processing room, cold room, red tag room. And uh, this is much like our current farm here, and it, with the exception being that we actually live in uh, this spray station room too, so that we really jammed all our functions together. Uh, and there's all kinds of advantages to that. Okay, um, gonna show you real quickly how we applied some of that thinking with our field management too. Uh, we had been doing a, a lot of plowing, seeding cover crops mowing cover crops, plowing and tilling again, just a lot of steps before a seed would go, go in the ground. And we wondered if there's not a faster way, a smarter way for a small farm to eliminate wasted motion before the seed goes in. And so we now have a three-step process. We're gonna pull out an old crop. We're gonna loosen the bed if needed, and then we're just gonna add some compost to the surface, leave it on top, and boom, we're done. And the turnaround time is about 30 minutes to get a bed ready and a lot fewer field passes, a lot less steps. So here's an example where we have, this is me putting some compost on top of, this is arugula that I let winter kill. We're just gonna spread compost right on the surface and then we're gonna plant uh, directly into that compost and boom, we're ready to go. And so it's a, it's a version of a no-till method. Uh, they call it, sometimes they call it a lasagna gardening method here where you just, pile on organic matter on the surface and grow directly into it. And benefits are fewer weeds, less work. You have slow release fertility, um, increased water and mineral holding capacity, all kinds of advantages to this. Uh, gonna talk about uh, touching your food. Uh, 
we're probably allowed to touch food products on farms about five times before you lose money on them. And so be, you wanna be careful about uh, how you harvest and how many times you're moving food before it gets in the hands of your customer. At this point, we do much of our harvesting into final containers. Here's, here is um, uh, basil, for example, that we're gonna harvest directly into the package going to the customer. You see the scales right out in the field. And then I showed you previously, the van is right at the door of the greenhouse. We're gonna load it directly onto the van. Uh, Valerie Lunas from France sent these images uh, to me. Uh, her green bean harvest, she's going to, with lean thinking, she transitioned her green beans to a lean system where they are going to harvest green beans directly into the containers going to her farmer's market customers. Okay. And so instead of harvesting in one big bin and then another several steps to get it into the final container, she's got it immediately into the crates and off they go to their farmer's market. Okay, um, I think what I'm going to do at this point, I wanna briefly talk about the Kaizen and then hopefully I'll be able to exit my sharing screen sharing here and get into answering your questions for the last about 15 minutes. What Kaizen means, the last step of that four-step process, is Kaizen really means precision. Continuous improvement is the direct translation. Uh, continuous improvement through precision. What that means is every season we become more decluttered. We use that 5S system every spring, every fall for one day on our farm and get rid of more junk. Every season, you more precisely define value what your customer wants, when they want it, and how much. What this means is every season you're shape-shifting your business because the landscape of local food is changing very quickly. And you simply cannot assume that your, the model, the business model you have right now will work five years from now. Muda, every year you get rid of more. The, what we do is keep a list of those seven mudas in the middle of our processing station. And we are constantly reminding ourselves to be on the lookout for how can we eliminate more muda every season. It's an ongoing process, it's a whole team effort. Because you wanna do Kaizen in teams. I said the Japanese in the Edo period used old fashioned teamwork because the idea is that workers are as close to muda, as close to waste as we are. So it makes sense to let them help us root it out. In fact, they often have better ideas than we. Um, this is one of our, our helpers here holding a, a worm. And uh, our helpers have come up with a lot of what I call horizontal Kaizen ideas or uh, ideas from the actual workers, people getting their hands dirty, doing the work. And it's one thing for a farm owner to sit in the office and think about better ways of doing things, which is a legitimate form of Kaizen. Uh, but really the better Kaizen, the longer lasting Kaizen is from the ground up. If you wanna go fast, go alone. If you want your farm to go a long distance, uh, then go together. And finally, here are a couple of apps that I use. If you want to know some of the particulars of how we do the Kaizen thing, you can research those apps on your own. Um, but uh, Trello is an app developed by um, um, some lean, um, lean software people uh, that has made our tasks, simplified our task management. And then Crew is one that helps us get our crew organized. Okay, I think what I'll do is summarize uh, and a couple slides here, then open up. There are two ways to grow a farm. You can get bigger every year, you can get smarter every year. Find a sustainable size and lean up. Uh, say, ask this question, halt, when do we have enough? Uh, E.F. Schumacher said this quote, where is the richest side It says halt, we have enough. I encourage you to find when is it, what is enough income for your farm? What is enough work to manage for your farm? How many acres seem feels like enough? What's a healthy balance? And then, Find that enough and grow a beautiful garden. What I mean is maintain the forest, the people and the things on your farm. Farm smaller and smarter and have fun in the process. And there's a worker, uh, my three-year-old son, who's having fun in the process of watching, of watching spinach. So there's proof that this all works. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna stop my screen sharing here and open it up uh, for your questions and conversation. Uh, Debbie asks, is there a risk uh, going from 60 to five focus crops. What if the demand drops for a certain crop or a crop pickled? How do you choose the focus crops? Okay, so that's a great question. And there certainly, uh, there certainly is a risk. And I should say that we have five 
focus crops, and we still grow more than 20 types of crops. We just have five that are in the highest demand uh, that we've really focused on leaning up our production of. And I'll be honest with you, the, the average number of crops grown in Indiana is one, corn or soybeans. <laughs> so to have five is considered a very diverse farm uh, in our context here. However, certainly the more crops you have, the more diversity you have, but you cross a line at some point where diversity adds complexity, and you cross a line at some point where you're introducing more complexity than it's paying off for you, if that makes sense. That's gonna be different on every farm. And on our farm, it was about five, what to get beyond about five crops we're really focusing on, we introduced a lot of complexity and we, we, we were starting to lose focus and profits. Now, how do we choose those crops? In the case of, in our case, selling to restaurants, it was a matter of asking restaurants uh, what, uh, what crops you want and then, uh, and going from there, and then applying our metrics, making sure that those crops yield $3 a square foot or more. That $40 worth fits into one of our 40 gallon totes. So in general, light and lightweight and high dollar value totes. With our CSA customers, uh, what we heard was they want, it's like four legs to a table, uh, every, to a kitchen table. They want every week these four things, tomatoes, some type of an allium, uh, whether it be spring onions or onions or garlic, some type of an alien crop. Uh, some type of a green, uh, lettuce or spinach or arugula. And then the fourth leg would be a snack, something they can just grab and eat, like carrots or radishes or uh, uh, hakari turnips. Um, and as long as we're producing those four crops, we'll have happy CSA customers. And then we add a fifth crop, which is a surprise crop a bonus crop like popcorn um, or something fun. We'll put, a, uh, put pea shoots in one week or something like that. Uh, Emlyn uh, uh, Williams asked this question. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your names here, but what is your capital startup cost uh, per acre compared, compared with conventional horticulture? I'll be honest, I'm not sure where the cost is at, at conven conventional horticulture. The capital that we use in the images you showed here uh, would represent, be, including a, we have a 5,000 square foot greenhouse with fully automated systems, so heaters and louvers and such, and that was about a $30,000 investment, okay? And then beyond the greenhouse, we have between 20 and 30,000 uh, invested in other supplies and tools. And, uh, and that's not including the cost of the land, which land costs varies uh, all over the place. Um, so we're looking at probably 50 to 100,000 as a startup cost to be realistic to get to the point where, at least in our case, we're able to make a comfortable living doing this. Uh, what population do you have within one and a half miles of the farm? That's a great question. That's a college town of about 40,000 uh, 40, people. Uh, is your farm on top grade land? Do you have uh, any observations for people who are enthusiastic but only have access to less productive land. I have never farmed on top grade land. Uh, I farmed in four different places and all the good land is bought up. The corn farmers all have it and they're all richer than me. And so what we have here is very sandy land with a very high water table too. And so we have had to be creative in draining our land, having retention ponds here. Um, and with uh, a compost, too, it really has remedied any soil type that I've been on. Uh, heavy clay soils have uh, been a great way to loosen them up and very sandy soils like we have right now. It's a great uh, way to add structure and till to the sand. Uh, Savi asks, I would like to start a micro farm, but as you said, farmland is being purchased by big farms. Are there low cost options for acquiring a small plot? Are zoning laws an issue for farming urban land? This is a huge question. And uh, I think there, there are actually lots of creative options. And some of the best I have seen at, for low cost options is to find a wealthy landowner who has more land than they know what to do with and who shares some of the values that you might have and might be enthusiastic about uh, a young person or a new farmer coming on and using part of their land uh, for a uh, direct-to-consumer small-scale farm, uh, farming operation. And if you are just using a half acre or an acre or two 
uh, there are lots of options out there. If you're planning to go to the 10 to 20 acre or more uh, scale, then it's gonna be harder in, uh, to find those kinds of creative arrangements. And my advice is always whether, if you have a low cost creative arrangement like this, they have it written on paper. Um, even if you're it's your best friend or an aunt and uncle that you're dealing with, to have something on paper and something that gives you three years of security. Uh, because you don't want to go from one year to the next, wondering if you're going to farm the next growing season. It's too stressful. And then our zoning law is an issue. Uh, they absolutely are an issue. <laughs> and I'll tell you that, I, just be honest, that in, for me, they were a huge issue. Uh, we are inside city limits. And I'll tell you that the way we did it uh, was I went in and I asked for what they call an interdepartmental meeting. And I said, before we purchase the land, and I said, I want the fire marshal to be there. I want the zoning department to be there. Um, I want the, uh, the plumbing inspector to be there. I want everyone around the table who I'm gonna have to deal with in this development. And I got everyone uh, around the table and I showed them pictures of our farm and I, of our current farm, of our farm that we had at the time. And I said, I wanna basically move this small scale farm here. And here's my, and I had a rough sketch in my plans. And I said, is this something you guys can get behind me on? Because I don't want to be fighting. I don't want to be swimming uphill the whole time. And if this is something the city can't get behind on, fine, no problem. Um, we'll look somewhere else. But I just want to know before we start making these investments is in, because I want, to, I want to work with people as a team. And so what I was able to do was get a head, head nod or a handshake at that meeting from everyone saying, okay, this is a creative development and we're going to work with you somehow to make that happen. So. And, and in our case, they, that meeting was absolutely essential because we had all kinds of hiccups in our development. And had we not had that handshake at the very, very, very beginning, uh, it would have been tough. So I would recommend uh, uh, getting at least a head nod or a handshake at the beginning before you dive in. Uh, Simon asked, how do you deal with customers who want to place an, an order, but there isn't enough uh, value on the banner order achieve, to achieve your delivery metrics? Uh, this is tough and we just have have had to be a bit disciplined and to tell some customers uh, that no I'm sorry we can't produce that item for instance I had a chef this winter who wants uh, who wanted uh, shishito peppers and she was the only customer who wanted shishito peppers and I just know that she's a very shape-shifty customer and she might uh, she might cancel that order and it's a small order and it just didn't quite fit our system. And so I had to tell her, really, I'm sorry, we can't, but I do have these 20 other crops uh, that we'll be happy to consider producing for you. Ideally, you have more, uh, you're, you can get to where, you're, where you overdevelop your markets is the way they put it in lean. The idea being that you uh, find more customers than you really need. And so you're, you're, in, a, you're in a strong position uh, to sort of pick and choose the best customers and to pick and choose um, the more profitable crops. Um, Matt is asked, Matt asked, I think this is a brilliant mindset and approach, but how resilient is it world when you can't predict that if you order something, when it will arrive, et cetera. In the UK, many of our seed companies have currently stopped taking orders due to over demand. Will you be adapting your systems to add in more resilience? Oh, this is a really great question, a really loaded question, because as we were seeing, like the largest seed companies here in the U.S. have stopped taking orders too, and are, 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 are shipping uh, only to commercial accounts. And so absolutely, we're definitely looking at um, certainly saving uh, seeds from our heritage and heirloom tomato seeds. Uh, from year to year, because that's really the backbone of our business, and we can do a better job at saving seeds, to be honest, than we have been in the past. And I think all farms are going to need to look at how can they supply uh, what they need, and making compost too. In the last couple of years, we've moved to making our own compost instead of instead of shipping that in, because I've realized how important that is to our business. So, for for me personally, if I can make good compost. Um, from the pastures that I have, and if I can save my heirloom tomato seeds from one year to the next, um, I've got some built-in resilience. Um, and there's certainly, I'll still be re relying on row covers from other manufacturers, and I'm not, I'm no way close to being 100% resilient, but 
I think that's a very legitimate question and, and I encourage you to find ways to build resilience in your systems. Uh, one question that Poppy asked, does Ben recommend a cedar, the Zhang cedar? Uh, it starts with a J-A-N-G-E. A -A uh, the Jang cedar is a Korean cedar and it's the most precise and it will work in all types of soil conditions. And my book has a chart uh, sh showing you the roller spacing and seeds, uh, roller and sprocket si sightings you need to use to make that chain work properly. Delana, uh, where do you source your compost uh, from being that there is no waste to deal with and you have no animal manure? I ha we have actually nine acres of uh, pasture, and so we cut our pasture to make quite a bit of the compost. Uh, we're in maple tree country here, and so we get a lot of maple leaves uh, from the city of Goshen. They collect the leaves from people and uh, bring that onto our property here. However, with making compost, the point is you want to find the lowest cost carbon sources close to your property uh, as possible. Low cost carbon, close to your property, and get it to your property. And that's going to be different no matter where you live. It might be horse manure for you. Uh, it might be uh, peat. Maybe there's some peat bogs or something close to you. Uh, uh, really, I've made successful compost with all, any kind, with all kinds of carbon. Um, but that's a whole afternoon topic. Uh, however, to get carbon onto your property and let it start decomposing is really important. Uh, would you have left farming if you hadn't discovered the lean system? I'm not sure how, if I would have or not, but I would definitely, uh, we'd probably not be farming full time for a living. Uh, I'd I was doing some construction work. Uh, part-time and I'd probably still do, be doing com some construction and Rachel was teaching in the schools and she'd probably still be doing some teaching too. Uh, what Lean did was showed us a route to where we can where we can raise our hourly age high enough that we could farm for a full-time living. How many CSA subscribers and what cost a subscription? We're looking at probably up to 60 CSA members and $30 uh, dollars a week um, is a price point. Uh, with uh, that works with the idea being $25 a week of produce uh, and then about $5 a week for the, the, the delivery. And $25 is right, I talked about the four legs of our CSA table. So if each item we put $5 worth of those four uh, in the CSA box plus the one surprise, that's 25. And then $5 gets it delivered to the customers, how we're, we're structuring that. This is the first season we've done the home delivery, so well, I'll let you know how it works. Uh, Justin asks, hi Ben, what have you defined as enough for your business and personal life? Thanks. Ooh, a loaded philosophical question. Uh, I would say that I am every, um, I am con we, I would say Rachel and I, are, our family, we're constantly defining enough. And it's a constant challenge in our cultural context, which tells us that we never have enough. They say that most of us say that we'd be happier if we had 20% more, no matter what our income level. If you make $100,000 a year, you'd be happy with 120. If you make $10,000 a year, you'd be happy with 12. So no matter what your income level, you say you'd be happier with 20% more. So our challenge is to say, how can we say, find happiness and define enough as, as what we have? Enough is what we have. Uh, perhaps a bit less than what we have. And that's how I, the best way I can think of right now to define enough. Okay, thank you very much. You've been a great audience and really great questions. And um, I need to sign off at this point, uh, but I hope we can keep the conversation rolling. And uh, good luck on your farms this season.